You're listening to Nutrition Matters Podcast with Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Hey everyone, it's Paige, your favorite nutrition podcaster and dietitian. Nutrition Matters Podcast explores what really matters in nutrition and health with a sensitive and realistic approach. This podcast relies on the support of listeners like you and needs donations to keep this project running. To help support the podcast, please consider making a donation at pagesmathersrd.com slash podcast. If you find this episode interesting, engaging, or helpful in your life, please consider donating, sharing with friends and family, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can leave a review about this podcast straight from your podcast app, search Nutrition Matters Podcast, click reviews, and then write a review. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at Paige Smathers RD if you'd like to have a little more food for thought. Thank you for listening. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Nutrition Matters Podcast. My name is Paige and I'm your host and this is part two with my conversation with Anna Lutz about raising intuitive eaters. You guys, the feedback from the first episode we did about raising intuitive eaters was just phenomenal and I'm so glad that it's been helpful for you and we got a lot of comments a lot of questions as a follow-up and that is what Anna and I focus on today in this podcast is just talking through some of the listener questions and comments about about that episode so before we get into that I just want to take a minute to remind you about a few resources available to you So I have lots and lots of podcast listeners, lots of loyal people who have been following me for a long time, and I'm so grateful that that you've let me be a part of your life, and um, so thank you to you. I wanted to just take a minute to say, you know, if you have a moment to just hop on iTunes and leave a review, that is really, really greatly appreciated. So just go ahead and and, uh, on your phone. You just, if you have an an iPhone, you just hop in your podcast app, click on search, even though you have Nutrition Matters Podcast in there, click on search, search for Nutrition Matters Podcast, and um, click on the podcast art, and then click on reviews, and then click on write a review. That is so, so appreciated, and if you've ever gotten anything out of this podcast, um, just that tiny little act of leaving a review gives back in so many ways to me. So I would really, really appreciate that. And thank you to those of you who have already done it. Um, Another thing I wanted to talk quickly about is my online course, which is a 10 week online course all about helping you heal your relationship with food. So if you've enjoyed the podcast and if you um, feel like you'd like to kind of take it to the next level, this this course is perfect for that. It's an online course, it's uh, 10 weeks long, but you can really take it at your own pace Uh, This course is perfect for anyone who's working on healing your relationship with food, but kind of still needs a little bit more guidance and help diving deep into that and finding a way to make it work individually. Um, It's perfect for anyone who's looking for realistic long-term solutions to be able to apply nutrition into your life in a healthy way, both on a mental and a physical level. And... um, If you're kind of still feeling a little bit confused or curious about how to make this practical, this is this is also another reason that the course could be a great fit for you. So, um, yeah, if you're if you're interested in checking that out, I have it up on my website, pagesmathersrd.com slash course. And go ahead and take a look, see what people are saying about it and read a bit more about it. See if it might be a good fit for you. And the last thing I wanted to also say is uh, if, if any of you are interested in joining the online Facebook group for the podcast, uh, just search Nutrition Matters Podcast Study Group in your Facebook and, and join the discussion with lots of other like-minded people who are interested in these issues. And I pop in there and, um, and talk to you guys a bunch too, and I'm a part of the discussion. So that's a lot of fun. Okay, I think that's all of the announcements, and with that, let's get on with talking with Anna Lutz, who is a registered dietitian in private practice in Raleigh, North Carolina, Um, and we kind of continue on this conversation about raising intuitive eaters, so enjoy. Well, Anna, welcome back to Nutrition Matters Podcast. It's so fun to be able to do a part two with you because part one really was a hit, so thanks for being here. 
I'm thrilled to be here. Um, it was so fun to get feedback from um, the first podcast, and I love speaking with you, so I'm so thrilled to be back. Yay, me too. And this this topic is really important, and I think, like I said last time, I think parents are, you know, listeners are feeling like it makes sense for them, and maybe they're really able to put some of these things into practice for themselves, but then the question becomes, how do I extend this into how I parent? And so I, it makes sense that there's a lot of questions and a lot of sort of um, – a lot of support that's needed in this area because it's it it can be kind of tricky and again it's very counterculture so it makes sense that we kind of need to to have a part two uh, to add on to the conversation. Absolutely. Um, don't, I, don't we wish it was simple? Parenting was simple enough that we could just read something or hear something once and that would be that. But we certainly both know how complicated. Uh, us parents are, but also our children. So yeah. the more we can talk about it, the better. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. just, it's it's such a fun topic and it's so freeing and uh, just just a different way to look at things than you normally hear. So, uh, so it's fun. It's fun to be a part of it. And I'm so glad that you're here again. And um, so let's get into the, into the topic for today. So I put out a kind of, let's see, what's the word, a prompt to some of the, the Facebook podcast listening group that I have. And just for anyone who wants to join that group, it's Nutrition Matters Podcast Study Group. And um, I just put out a little message in there and said, hey, what did you guys think of this episode about raising intuitive eaters? And what would you like us to talk about in part two? Because we had, we had kind of planned to meet again, you and me, Anna. Yes. And I got a lot of comments, a lot of questions. So we're going to kind of work through those plus sort of weave in some of the things that we didn't get to last time. And we'll just see how this goes. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Okay. All right. So let's see. What do you, where do you want to start? Do you want to start just with the comments and we'll kind of hit on those and then weave things in? That sounds great. Okay. I'm, I'm excited to hear from the listeners, kind of their questions. So the first one says, this is great. A lot of what you covered is for younger kids. What about a podcast that focuses on transitioning to older kids, kids who are getting more independence, going out with friends, making their own breakfasts or lunches, any guidelines for parents on letting go, especially on helping them recognize when foods are too easy to eat, too much of. You started to touch on this at the end. How do we talk about them about this? How do we talk to them, sorry, about this in a way that doesn't turn into a conversation about limiting certain foods? Love that question. Oh, that's such, and it's such an important question and something I feel like I'm asked, asked so much. Um, I think a lot of people will say, well, this sounds, the way you approach um, feeding sounds so great for younger kids, but what happens, you know, with a middle schooler who can, you know, be out with their friends or um, they want more autonomy? Um, and so it's certainly an important topic. And I think about it and kind of kind of two ways. If if from the beginning a parent is really setting up that structure of set meal and snack times, um, that transition can be really natural and important that the middle school or high schooler is starting um, to take over some of those duties. Um, you know, what can be hard sometimes, sometimes I'm approached by people who maybe want to shift um, their approach to feeding with older children. Um, and sometimes doing a little bit of more of that structure um, might help um, first before kind of, you know, really thinking about where, where are we um, in that kind of parenting style and where is that structure and making sure the structure is there. Um, right. So the idea being like, you know, there's a difference between if you were able to start with that structure and with that division of responsibility from early childhood, <clears throat> it might feel like a bit more of a natural transition to say, okay, now that you're in, you know, ninth grade, it makes sense that you're going to be packing your lunch or you're going to be in charge of your breakfast or whatever it might be. Right. And right. Um, there's already that pattern set of this is typically sort of how we eat or what we eat or, or when we eat. Right. And, right. um, and you're, you, we trust that you'll do what's best for your body. Um, and, and we're going to give you some of that freedom, but I can definitely see, <clears throat> excuse me, how somebody 
who kind of didn't catch on to this type of type of way of feeding uh, early on. And now now their kids are maybe, you know, teenagers and they're like, okay, how do I start doing this with those kids? Right? Right. So there's sort of a difference there. Right. And, and, and um, I think it, the big thing, the commonality of it is kind of, well, what kind of structure can we put in place that would support a child to become a competent eater? And right. so there still can be structure, right? It doesn't need to exactly. be just completely unstructured. Exactly. I think that's probably the biggest thing for a parent to think on is, okay, am I providing that structure, meaning um, the when and the what, right? The, the divisional mm-hmm. responsibility, the parent deciding when is a it's time to eat and what's available. Um, and we can get into more, of, well, you know, of course, as the child gets o- older, they have more access to food and how to handle that. Um, but I do really, really, really believe that structure is important. And and what I find, and, and I know I may be the minority in thinking this way, is um, our society has started to give responsibility of food to children earlier and earlier, um, meaning um, um, having young elementary school children pack their lunch or have young elementary school prepare their age children prepare their breakfast. And I think that is a trend. And um, again, I might not, you know, I might, I think I'm the minority thinking that, but I really believe it's important um, to remember what the parents' jobs are so the child can do their jobs of becoming competent eaters. I haven't seen that trend. That's so interesting. But I'm not really in that world yet. You know, I'm, I still have young kids. Okay. So that's interesting. It's it's funny. Um, as, as I said before, my oldest is in fourth grade and she begs me to pack her own lunch. She says all of her friends pack their lunch and she, and so I'll do some, she'll help me is kind of the compromise we've made. I'll say, Hey, why don't you make your, your sandwich or, Hey, can you grab me a piece of fruit? So I think I'm, you know, she's involved. Um, but I just, I, I feel pretty strongly that a uh, elementary age um, children, child shouldn't be worrying about those parent jobs. You know, they should be worrying about kid jobs. Um, or, That's fascinating. Or, yeah. That she, that she wants to do that so much. Yeah, and that's <laughs> that funny. might come in your, in your uh, favor later. <laughs> <laughs> well, good point. That yeah. is her personality. I will yeah. say that. She's gung ho. She's like, yeah. I got this mom. Um, <laughs> what something you said earlier, really, really, um, I wanted to touch on really quickly is the idea that, that we can always apply structure and I don't know if I'm going to be the minority or unpopular here with this opinion, but I think that that's typically a really good place to start for adults too, for ourselves, for feeding ourselves. Um, a little bit of structure around, you know, when is it time to eat and when is it time to not eat? <laughs> you know, um, when are when is food available and when is food not available for you? Uh, just because. I find that when when I personally graze all day and food is just out and available and whatever, it's very difficult to have an appetite for a meal and sit down and, and enjoy it. You kind of are not really hungry, but not really full. It's not right. all that enjoyable. So I find that a touch of, you know, structure that's not too rigid and crazy, but just a little bit of structure around, oh, it's you know, it's dinner time or okay, dinner time is at six, so I wanna make sure I'm not eating this giant snack at five, you know, even as an adult can be sort of a helpful approach. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. I really get excited when I'm working with client, adult clients, and we're kind of using the division of responsibility, but for themselves. Ooh, I want to hear what you have to say about that. Tell me. Yes, it's, uh, you know, really, you know, if I'm having someone who I'm working with someone who maybe has a history of, um, Either Hold being on, really Anna, com- really quick. Yeah. For if anyone's just coming to this podcast and they're like, "What are they talking about? Division of responsibility." Oh, good. Can you good just question. reiterate, and then and then I want to hear what you have to say. Absolutely. So the it's it's the official title is EC Satter Division of Responsibility. So um, Ellen Satter has uh, is a pioneer in um, childhood feeding research. Um, And so the division of responsibility is that the parents have certain jobs and their jobs are to decide the when and the what and the where. 
um, of eating. So it's six o'clock, we're having dinner at the dinner table and we're having chicken, rice and broccoli. Um, and then once the parent has done their job to really allow the child to do their job, which is to decide um, if, if they're gonna eat the certain items and how much. Um, and so it's a structure, you know, you and I are talking about structure, it's a structure that a parent can, um, a way to approach feeding in a home. And what all the research shows is it really um, helps children become competent eaters, meaning um, that they grow up to eat a variety of foods, to regulate the amount they need, um, to be able to um, tolerate new foods. Um, but most importantly, I love it because it decreases worry and anxiety for the parent. And so once once that happens, the child has more space to um, grow as an eater. Perfect. And I'll link to their uh, Ellen Satter's website uh, and her actual di uh, division of responsibility explanation. But I just as we're referring to that, if someone's new to this stuff, I don't want them to be totally lost. So thanks for taking a second so to do that. And then go ahead and just I really would love to hear how, you know, could we talk about the division of responsibility in the feeding relationship where the parents have certain jobs and the kids have certain jobs. And so um, I, I totally I kind of think I know where you're going with this, um, but right. I've never heard anyone say it. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear your your thoughts on how an adult can kind of think about it that way, too. Yeah, when I'm when I'm working with an adult that maybe has a history of restrictive diet dieting, or um, a history, maybe they maybe their parents didn't model um, eating in a way that we're talking you and I are talking about. That sometimes we'll get to a place where it really feels like um, let's let's think about what structure you need. How do you want to parent yourself? Um, and so. We even talk about it in those terms, and, and if they have a child or they have a niece and nephew, we can think about it that way. You know, if you're taking care of your um, your niece for the day, what kind of structure would be in place? And they're able to say, well, I'd have a breakfast for them and then a morning snack. And so we'll, you know, talk about that we have to be our own parents. When we're adults, there's no one else that's going <laughs> to do that for us as much as sometimes we would love that. Um, and so that structure doesn't need to be strict like a diet, but it can be loving and caring, just like um, putting structure around bedtime or putting structure around other things that we do for children, but we do it for ourselves. And then once we've put that structure in place, meaning, okay, it's breakfast time. I know I feel better if I have some protein and carbohydrates and some fruit. Um, but once I've done that, then I can take a deep breath and really trust that my body knows how much. And so that you're both kind of playing this parent role and child role, but taking care of yourself in a loving way. Um, I feel like so many of our clients take such loving, wonderful care of others. And sometimes we are working on them caring and loving themselves um, in that same way. Um, and, and so I get really excited with that work. That's probably, it's usually um, work that's done further along in someone's um, recovery or, or working on their eating, but it oftentimes it's really exciting. It is exciting. And I, I loved everything you said. And I would just add too that, first of all, parenting yourself in a lot, kind and loving way is a whole lot easier if you have that sort of like track in your head, meaning like right. if your parents showed you that, it's easier to know what that looks like. Uh, for instance, you know, I had loving, great parents and yeah. and I can come back to the idea that I remember, you know, my mom would say certain things all the time and that, and it pops up in my head at random points and I'm like, yep, that's what my mom said and, <laughs> and, and it's coming back to me. And, um, right. and so I had that model and I recognized that, that those of us who were able to and fortunate to have parents who who helped set that precedent have probably an easier time recognizing what a kind and loving self-parenting might look like. Um, but I also, I love, love the idea that you're saying, and I've never thought about it in the exact way of, you know, you're kind of doing the division of responsibility with yourself. But right. how I have thought about it is, you know, the similarly to what you're saying, where if you're a parent and you're treating yourself like you would treat your child, there's two really cool things about that. First of all, you're going to be so loving and compassionate when things 
when you struggle with things, right? So if your right. if your child comes up to you and says, "Mom, I ate all the Halloween candy and my stomach hurts so bad, I don't even know what to do," I and they're crying, right? The last thing in the world you do is scream at them and be so mad at them and right. you know not let right. them eat the next day or something like that. Right. But right. What you would do is you would take that child and put them on your lap and stroke their hair and look them in the eye and say, everything's going to be okay. I'm so sorry your stomach hurts. Let's learn from this. And let's, you know, when you're ready, let's talk about it and let's figure out how to make sure this doesn't happen again for you, you know? And so there's this natural built-in mechanism of lots of compassion and lots of kind of learning and growth and um, kindness, right? Right. Right. So I love right. that idea in that regard. But then I also love the idea of kind of parenting yourself does naturally lend to that idea of structure and, you know, where you'd never send your kid off to school without anything in their bellies right. so that they can learn, right? right? But right. but why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we expect just like, you know, a, a piece of toast in the car to, to make it, to make us have energy for, for the day until lunchtime, you know? Right. So... Anyway, that's that's what it, where I come down on it. Is I think it's a really, really important visual exercise to kind of say, okay, if I were my own child, how would I how would I treat myself? And so, absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, you said that well. And that structure is okay. You know, you and I are um, feel strongly about uh, approaching things from a non diet approach and intuitive eating, but that doesn't mean not having structure and not putting the things into place that that helps you listen to your body. Right. And or that helps help you feel, your body. feel great. And that help you, um, you know, it's a whole lot easier to eat, to eat an apple if you have one, you know, <laughs> it's, right. Right. So yeah, like right. shopping and planning and having things in your house can be, can, yeah, can be part of that structure too, where, absolutely, you know, the last absolutely. thing I want to do is go to the grocery store and think and plan more food things after I've spent my whole week, talking, writing, thinking about food, right? <laughs> right. I mean, it's a little exhausting when this is what you do for work, but but it's in it's structured into my week because it's it's the only way for me to to be able to do it, you know? So Right, right. And then for me, um the the way I kind of deal with that is I I try to simplify and get help for the things I really need help with. So I um I order my groceries online because being in the grocery store for an hour with my children is taxing. <laughs> so I make sure I get my groceries, nice but I, <laughs> I pay, I pay a little extra so that someone else is doing that. And so I, I try to pass that on to my clients. Let's, you know, it doesn't have to be beautiful. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be that you're making um, gourmet meals, you know, structure can be, um, um, you know, sometimes just getting food to the table at a certain time and that, that there's a, a somewhat balance on the table. It doesn't have to be um, picture perfect or ready for Pinterest. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just looking back at this question, and I want to make sure we're hitting on the various I questions. Think she... a tangent. It's okay. <laughs> Tangents are great. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. That's totally fine. I've loved what what we've been talking about. So, okay. So one of her questions is: Any guidance for parents on letting go? Mm, that's a good one. Um, especially on helping them recognizing recognize when foods are too easy to eat too much of um and how do we talk to them about it, this in a way that doesn't feel like you're telling them to limit certain foods so what i think the structure idea is a really good idea and um i will admit i don't have older kids so i'm not in this situation yet but i would imagine that you know an afternoon snack and you know here's here's what we have you can choose between this and this or, okay, you're going to go out with your friends and you're going to be home at 4 o'clock. Uh, I, I really want you to be able to be hungry for dinner. So when if you grab some food, make sure that you're eating not too much so that you can be hungry and we can sit down as a family tonight. You know, I think those types of conversations are reasonable. What else would you add to the idea of what structure could look like in older kids? Well, what, what I, the way I think about it is is if parents can really remember that their modeling and what they do day after day is going to speak much louder than anything they try to say or explain, even to middle age, a middle middle school age and high school age um, children. So I think sometimes we want to be able to kind of explain something through to, through a child, you know, maybe, uh, um, 
you know, you went to your friend's house and you had this, this, and this. And so I don't think you should eat that tonight or um, that those words, although well, very, very well intended, sometimes are really hard for children to um, interpret them in the way that we intend them to. And so instead of maybe feeling like we need to explain things to children, to know that our example um, and, and again, the way we're approaching food at home um, actually will speak much louder. So the way I kind of think about it is um, um, kind of thinking if a child was at a friend's house in the afternoon and they come home and they say they're hungry, um, that I might ask them, have you had, had you had your afternoon snack yet? And if they say yes, say, okay, well, we're, we're going to have dinner in a little while. So I'm still deciding the when, or, you know, no, I didn't have an afternoon snack all day. Okay, well, why don't you sit down? I'm going to cut you up some apple um, because we're going to have dinner really soon. Um, and so rather than a more hearty afternoon snack that we would have had earlier on. Um, and so again, just kind of thinking that the way you approach food in your home is actually, I think, the strongest language. I've heard a lot from parents with older kids say stuff like, you know, every night we're at a baseball game or we're, we're not even home till nine o'clock and yes. it's crazy. I mean, what, what do you do in that situation? I'll tell you what my husband would do. He's king of like packing meals like, oh, we're going to be out and it's going to be lunchtime while we're gone. Like, OK, let's let's pack a lunch. He's so on it. I swear That's awesome. he's the reason why I'm a I'm a good dietitian. <laughs> Just in terms of like why I'm able to like, you know, keep these things um, afloat, even though I kind of hate doing food in real life sometimes. Right. Right. Uh, that's what I meant by that. Uh, I know what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, yeah. What can parents do when they're in that just crazy phase of we're at volleyball games and we're at dance recitals and we're like just doing a million things and yeah, a home cooked meal sounds great, but hello, that doesn't happen unless it's Sunday night or something. Right. Well, I think it's worth taking really taking the time to think, well, what can we do? So it may be that um, if someone has dance every night from, you know, five to nine, that their afternoon snack becomes a little bit more like a, a little meal that mom sits down, mom and the two children sit down together or dad or whoever is home in the afternoon or babysitter, um, that that's when they kind of have a little bit it looks more like a meal. It's a little bit heartier because it needs to get all the way till night, fuel that child all the way till nine o'clock. Um, it may be that then um, that they're packing some heartier snacks for the breaks that happen during um, during the in between the classes that are in that that time. Um, that there there needs to be that little bit of thought, so it doesn't have to be. Um, I'm packing a four course meal to have um, in, uh, um, during the break, but more, okay, how can this, how can I make sure that my child is fueled enough for their activities and that we make some space for the food? You know, in an ideal world, um, there would be a way to sit down for dinner. Um, and I, I love trying to work out with families how that can be done, but I do understand that sometimes that's just not going to happen. But at the end of the day, a child needs to needs enough food to grow and have energy. And so how can we carve out enough time and enough um, focus so that food is kind of in its proper place? Yeah, that's great. That's a really great thought. Um, I also wanted to just say that I am really, really drawn and influenced to the idea of minimalism. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I think that that's something that could be said here. And, and obviously, this is not in any type of attempt to get people to, you know, stop doing their activities or anything like that, because those are really fun and really important part of life. But my thought here is, you know, have have you read that book, The Magic Art of Tidying Up or something like that? Yes. It's called something like that. Okay. I yes. love that idea of like, you pick up every object you have and you decide like, does this bring me joy? Does it not? And then right, you keep the right. ones that do. And I think that's great on a physical level, like the stuff you have in your house. But then I think it's also great on, you know, more like a figurative level, like pick up everything that you do during your week and take a look at it and say, does this bring us joy? Does this bring my child joy? Does this, 
is this is this good? Is this functioning? Is this working for us? And maybe keep the things that are and, and, t- and leave the things that aren't. And I think sometimes parents feel like in order to be a good parent, you have to pack up the schedule and get kids right. exposed to every activity. And as a result, you kind of lose your brain, you know? Right, so I, right. That's not to say that everyone needs to do the exact same um, amount of activities or whatever, but just take a look and see if if your life is overly busy just because you want to uh, give your kids everything, you know, but then as a result, you can't, you, you never can. It's, you know, and you're just feeling like you're constantly falling short. That might be something to take a look at and see if you can make some changes to just help life feel a bit more functional and perhaps simple. I 110% agree. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's where our society is right now. Um, but if, like you're saying, if each little family can stop and think, is this working for us or how could this work for us? Um, especially if it's a family thinking um, we could be approaching food in a different way. You know, I think food is obviously so important. You know, it's one of our five basic needs. So if, if other things are kind of um, preempting that, um, it may be worth it to stop and think, do we need to do something different so that food can be at its in its place? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. it shouldn't be just this, you know, annoying afterthought thing. It, it should it does right. require quite a bit of thought and planning, and and that's okay. And that's not something to be, you know, annoyed with. I think it's just a. I, I'm saying that to myself. I'm like, okay, right. Paige, it's okay. I know it's kind of hard, but we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. And, it, yeah. and I, again, I, I say this to myself. It doesn't have to be um, that I've cooked for an hour. We just need, you know, yep. need dinner on the table um, and hopefully everyone there um, for a little bit enjoying exactly. it. Because um, we do know, I mean, the research really, really shows how important family meals are. Um, and that doesn't mean it has to be seven nights a week and it has to be dinner. Um, but what, but thinking through, do we have time that we're all sitting together and eating um, really can have a benefit. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So do you think we've done a good job with that first question? Uh... I hope so. I, I, again, I, um, I just kind of want to reiterate that sometimes we don't need to explain with words. I find myself saying that to parents so much, you know, we don't need to explain why this, the candy are, um, maybe isn't the best choice or that it might make you feel this way and that way. Maybe you say, Hey honey, um, why don't, why don't you bring that candy that you friend, your friend gave you and sit down with me with some peanut butter and crackers and, um, let's have our afternoon snack. And that, that action can show, um, actually have a bigger impact than explaining all the nutritional details of candy. Awesome. I like that. And, and maybe I've, I've seen this in my own parenting experiences when a child comes to you with their own um, experience or their own questions about, oh, why does my stomach hurt? And you can kind of say, hey, uh, let, let's take a look. What do you what do you think? Could it be, you know, was it, did you sleep enough last night? Do you think it was, because sometimes it's because you, you might have to go to the bathroom and you just kind of walk them through what it could be and help them maybe trace it back and say, oh, yeah, I did, I, I did, you know eat seven cookies and or something like that and and help them recognize what was going on but not necessarily be like stop eating cookies and (laughs) you're you're gonna die or whatever yeah right right (laughs) and it could be if they say oh yeah I did eat seven cookies at my friend's house oh huh yeah and (laughs) you know that can speak really loud yeah more than like well that's what it was Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know those cookies don't ever do that again right right yeah (laughs) <laughs> yep. Okay. So I think I like that. Actions Good. actions are things to focus focus on being that example. And then if if they come to you with thoughts or questions, maybe maybe helping them come to their own conclusions by asking more questions and, and avoiding that tendency we have to just educate. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Until okay. they're much older. Yep. Yeah. Where they can kind of handle the, the nuance. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So this second question uh, says, I'm a fellow registered dietitian and I have been for the past 16 years. However, I am newer to the non-diet intuitive eating perspective. Of course, I wish I could go back to when my kids, now 11 and 13, were younger and do things differently, but unfortunately I can't. I'd be curious to hear tips on neutralizing food and diet messages once the healthy message has been put out there. 
How can we help kids to rediscover their intuitive eating in situations such as this? This is a really good question. It's so good. It's yeah. such a good question. And something, again, I get kind of asked a lot, like, okay, Ellen Satter's, <laughs> Ellen Satter's great, but my children are in middle school. What do I do? <laughs> um, and so um, I think, again, thinking, how can I put that structure in place in an appropriate way? So it may not be that all of a sudden I say you never can have an afternoon snack unless I give it to you. If that's what you've, if you've always let your child open the pantry or, um, and that's not exactly what this person's saying, but um, that maybe you just start to model, you know, rather if you've always said do eat this and don't eat that, or you're eating too much of this, that you think, okay, now in my home, um, I'm not going to approach things that way. And so I'm going to more model, I'm going to prepare foods more that I want my children to be eating. Um, and, and I think that's really doable with um, older children. Now, I think, I think this happens to most people because even if you're not talking about dieting or quote, good food, bad foods in your home, our children are exposed to it. Um, you know, our children come home and say, my friend told me that I shouldn't eat this or my friend's mom told me that um, this will make me, um, you know, this will make her gain a lot of weight or, you know, that they, yeah. they're exposed to these messages um, regardless of what's going on in your home. But again, if, if you can be kind of like we were just talking about, like inquisitive, like, huh, why do you think they'd say that? Um, or, um, or, you know what, like, um, let's think about how we approach that in our house. Do we have, um, do we have candy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner all day long? Well, no, mommy. Okay. Well, we, you know, it's fine to have it some, and, um, you know that, um, you know, again, kind of just modeling, modeling that for them, but also talking through it. Exactly, and. Um, this is really tricky because I, I know that it's definitely a parent pet peeve when people who aren't parents are like, this is how you do this tricky parenting thing. This is how you get your right. kid to sleep at night or something. You're like, yeah, right. I wish it was that easy. Right. right. So I Here's feel, the solution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I feel a little bit um, unqualified to talk about what it's like to have older kids, you know, um, right. because I don't have that experience. And so... Um, that's why I'm glad you're here, because I know <laughs> you're further down the parenting road than me. Um, but the idea, I think I think the, the core of what she's getting to in this question is, okay, I was just doing the best that I knew, which was right. saying, you know, perhaps, and I'm maybe putting words in her mouth here, but, you know, having a really nutrient-focused, um, nutrient-focused conversations with my kids about about what foods are are good and what nutrients you need to get and calories perhaps and maybe you know iron and zinc and you know maybe just right. getting a little bit too into the the biochemistry of um, of nutrients and nutrition right and then now it's like your eyes are open you're like whoa hold on maybe there's this whole different way to approach it but I've spent the last maybe ten years teaching my kids that that sugar is bad and that you know, carbs are whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm totally putting words in her mouth here, but I'm kind of trying to imagine some parents that I, right. that I work with right. and talk with too. Right. So if you're listening, I'm not calling you out on this. I'm just kind of speaking from what I've heard. Um, right. And so that, that transition, um, it can feel kind of scary because I think it can feel like, and, and I've heard people express this before, and I'm sure you have too, like just really, really angry. Like, how, why was I told lies like my whole life, right, <laughs> you know, like, right, right. I thought I was doing the right thing. Maybe, you know, in my own pursuit of health for me, I thought I was doing the right thing in my, in my parenting. Like how dare these dumb people teach me the wrong things. And so there's a lot of, there can be a lot of frustration um, in that just sort of making a paradigm shift with food. It can be really hard, especially when, you might feel like there's some things you did with your kids who are your pride and joy and absolute right. love. You're like, how, oh, that's so, that can be really frustrating. Absolutely. So how does a Absolutely. parent work through that? I don't know. 
It's tough because I'll be honest with you. I'm struggling in my head with, I think, if it was an older child or old, older children, and I'm thinking eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, and up, you could say, you know, I've, you've heard mommy say these things. Um, and you know what? I was wrong. And I'm going to approach food differently now. Um, you know, in the right situation, it may be worth if you've said a lot over the years to kind of acknowledge you know what, I'm going to make a shift here. Um, if you have an older child, um, y- you'd have to decide. If you have if an older child or if you have a child that you feel that conversation is appropriate for, right? Like exactly. just maturity wise, can they, can they hear that? Can they understand that? Right, right, and right. I think some, I think some could, you know, I think some could. Yeah. And I think, um, again, though, if, if you feel like that could set up any kind of um, struggle, like, well, mommy, remember you said, <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 um, you know, to, to really think through, is that going to kind of help neutralize the situation or am I adding any kind of fuel to the fire? Um, but again, that if you really work towards this structure we're talking about, even with middle school and up, it might take a longer time for kids to return to being intuitive eaters, but it does happen. And you can, um, um, read more in Ellen Satter's books, both um, Secrets of Feeding a Healthy Family and Your Child's Weight, Helping Without Harming, that she talks about this, that um, that it do- a child does move towards being a competent eater, even if um, maybe early on things were done differently. It just takes a little bit longer the older they are. And I... I think I'm kind of thinking out loud here, which is always dangerous on a podcast. But, <laughs> um, you know, if a child calls you out and says, hey, mom, you're why are you buying ice cream? You eat ice cream is bad. Let's just say that that's the situation. Um, you know, I think there's room to just kind of gently and very neutrally be like, you know what? I don't I don't really that's not true anymore. Or I, I've changed right. my mind about that. Or I've realized that, you know, all foods can fit. In a, in a healthy, happy lifestyle or just kind of keep it, keep it light and breezy, but sort of say a right. lot with a few words. That's sort of what I'm thinking. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I was even kind of thinking, um, you know, if someone sat down their child and said, you know, we're going to approach things differently, you know, um, you know, I've said these things, but I really think that your body is smart and we can, we can trust it. Mommy's going to help with buying all, a variety of foods that I could see some children, um, and, and I'm, again, thinking of my oldest, th- that that would come back at some point. But, Mommy, you said, <laughs> you said this, that, <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, you said, you know, any foods are fine, and so why are you telling me this? Um, but, um, again, we all know our children, and thinking about how that conversation could be helpful. Um, I think for a lot of people, it really could be. Um, well, and you can even say, you know, grownups are just doing the best they can, and they're learning too. And when I learn something new, I like to share it with you, or or something right. like that. And right. man, I thought I was doing the right thing, but but man, I've I've learned some new things that help me feel so much healthier and happier. And and I want you to feel be that way too. Or I don't know. I I think that there's space for like, hey, I'm. I'm figuring this out too. And exactly. it's kind of cool exactly. for kids to, to know that and see that a little I level think- of like, oh, so you just, my parents don't know everything and they're exactly. learning too, you know? Exactly. Um, and more than everything for the person writing this question, you know, I just want to ass- reassure them that, um, that it's not too late, <laughs> that, that you can really bring these principles into your home and with, um, you know, 11, 13 year old children that, you, you know, you still have a long time. They're still going to be in your house a, a long time. And the, the way you talk about bodies and food can really, really, um, have a huge impact. And that when, if you ever hear them say something back to you that maybe you said early on, Again, what a great time to talk about it. Like, yeah, I did say that early, but I think I might have been thinking about that not the right way. And so why don't we look at it this way instead? Mm, That's great. That's really great. I like that, Anna. Okay, should we move on to the next one? That sounds great. Okay, so this one says, I loved the episode so much. I've been so focused on trying to encourage my daughter to listen to her body and not providing any negative messages about food. 
but I'm realizing that having a little more structure around food would probably be a positive thing. So maybe that's just more of a comment. Sorry, I didn't read that ahead of time. <laughs> but well, that, I do love that. Yeah. I do love that. Um, something I hear a lot is people saying, well, I need to teach my child to listen to their body. And so, so often I want to say, they already know how, <laughs> you know, we don't have to teach them. Um, and so, but the structure helps them listen to their body. And so that's kind of yep. a different, different, you know, it's a, it's nuance, but to really think, you know, we don't have to say, Hey honey, you need to listen to your body more. We set up the structure and they will listen to their body over time. You know, they may eat a, a lot at lunch because they love what you served um, and they may feel really, really full, but their body's really smart. They're going to self-regulate over the next day. Right. Um, so. And I, I think that, um, that with that structure, there's, there's space to say no sometimes. You know, if, if they're <laughs> asking for a food that, that you're not serving and they're, they're trying to throw a fit because you made certain foods that they don't like and they're, you know, it's okay to say no. You know, and, and some of that structure, I, I think, revolves around you say you say yes as often as you possibly can as a parent. But there's right. sometimes you say no because you right. you, it's just what you got to do. And so that's sometimes how I hear people interpret intuitive eating for kids is just, you know, free for all. And um, right. you never say no because you don't want them to develop a complex about a certain food. And, you, you know, like there's just certain it, it can be kind of taken to this like, no. It's a little bit too too far. Um, I know I might have mentioned this in the last episode, but I know for me it was really helpful um, when I would ask to have um, a treat. For example, in my house growing up, I had I, my parents are divorced, so I had one house that did things one way and another di that did it another way. And um, at one of my houses, there was a lot more boundaries. Um, and and structure around food than the other. Right. And so yeah. I kind of have two different perspectives and, and experiences with this. And I actually, looking back, appreciated the 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 boundaries and and structure with with treats specifically because I remember it sort of set this precedent that you know there's a certain amount that is fun and that's tasty and that feels good, and then there's a certain amount that really hurts me, <laughs> you know, like hurts my right. body, and. Um, and so with, I never actually put that together till just now speaking out loud. Like I really did have two experiences with this and I ate differently in the two houses. So. Right. Kind of right. I bet that's interesting to think about. Um, I do really believe children um, are comforted by structure, you know, that it's, it feels safe to them. Um, that doesn't mean it has to be rigid, rigid, rigid rules. Right. Um, There's a difference. When, <laughs> yeah. When things are too permissive, it, can, it doesn't feel, for some children, it can just feel, um, not feel as good as having just some, some structure, what, whatever it is, food or anything, you, you know? know what, that is so funny that you're saying that because what's popping into my mind is I, my five-year-old really does sometimes ask questions that she knows the answer to. And it's <laughs> totally like a test and it's not a manipulation. Right. I think it's just like a, it's like a checking in with me. Like, Hey, is my mom still my mom? Is she going to like, right. is she crazy? Is she going to say something totally out there? Or is she going to give me the answer? <laughs> I kind of think I I'm going to get. Right. Um, so, uh -oh. so there is that testing that goes on with, with questions and with, with some of the structure and, and that consistency um, around it can be helpful. I, I think that makes so much sense. And I and I agree with what you're saying. So many people interpret um, this way of feeding children as kind of free for all. And so I love what you said, which is it's a, part of the structure is saying no. You know, that is saying, no, this is what we're having for dinner. Um, and I deal with that, honestly, um, daily. <laughs> My middle yep. child... Um, He'll say, there's nothing for dinner I like, <laughs> um, you know, and so I'll, and, you know, and then we'll say, well, this is what we're having. And, you know, you need to sit with us and um, and he'll make do. And it, um, you know, it's over time and it's it's not at a meal or even over a week's time. But because of that line that we hold and honestly, it's hard. Um, it pulls at your heartstrings. But he has, you know, started to to eat different foods, be I really believe because of saying no. And so I'm so glad you highlighted that. It's not all about permission. 
Yeah, and I can't tell you how many times uh, my my three year old now will she does this weird thing where you put the food on her plate and put it in front of her, and then she flips a switch about something on the plate, like flips out, oh. and she takes it. She takes it, let's say the broccoli and and puts it on the table instead of on the plate. And you know sometimes it's worth it to kind of have that battle of like, no, put it back on your plate. You know, like you're fine. It's just broccoli. Right. You don't need to eat it. Just, just sit there and look at it. Um, but sometimes I don't, you know, sometimes I'm like, whatever, just put it on the table. Who cares? Right. <laughs> um, right. Depending right. on my mood. Right. Right. Um, and what's so interesting is literally nine times out of 10, she'll end up eating the broccoli. It's like, it's just like with, it's just something she almost had to do. I just, I have to freak out right now because I'm two, you know, and now she's three, but she just turned three. (laughs) This is just what I have to do. So mom, like buckle up. This is just going to be the next five minutes. I'm going to be crazy and then I'll be fine. Um, And I'm testing you. Are you going to make me eat the broccoli or not? Yeah. Are you going to make it, are you going to make me have it on my plate? You know? Yeah, um, exactly. And, and and for some of the listeners, you know, you'll hear different things, but um, for some children, it's helpful to do it, you know, family style. If oh yeah, totally. Expressions. I think we hit on that. Our before. house is not is not structured for that because um, anyway, we're moving actually to a new oh my house goodness. where we're going to have lots more space. But our our house that we're currently in was the type of house where we literally had to serve in the kitchen and bring it into the the other room because there just wasn't enough space. So, and every family's different, right? And and I think it also depends on the age child. Yeah, you know exactly. So, um, you know that's a good absolutely. thing to bring up, though. I think you know there is a difference between family style and then putting food on a plate for a child. So, I think we're going to be able to transition to that um, in the new house. So I'm excited. That's really exciting. Moving can be exhausting, but exciting. Yeah. I know. Buckle up. This weekend's going to be crazy. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So here's the last question. Actually, there was one more that came up that I didn't write down here. So maybe two more if you have time for it. Sure. Okay. So this one says, do you have any tips for raising intuitive eaters when your spouse is not 100% on board? They're more of the first eat three bites of veggies, then you can have more chips type of parent. Oh, that's such a hard one. (laughs) I'll be so honest with you. Um, It's just, it's tough. I think in an ideal world, um, the two parents would get on, on somewhat of a same page because if one parent is doing one thing and another parent is doing another, um, I think it can be confusing for the child. Um, So what I would, if I was working with this family, I would be um, having conversation with the conversations with the parents um, of what what could be the structure of the, of your home, and that both parents are are doing it. So it may not be by the book division of responsibility, but at least both the parents have kind of agreed on this is how we're going to approach it. Um, if that's just not going to happen, um, you know what I would say is is um, again, with modeling and, and to not say, well, you don't have to do that with me, <laughs> you know, not to, to highlight the difference between mom and dad, but then just to really model, um, um, through your own eating, but also, um, when you're, you're feeding the child, if they say, Hey mommy, do I have to do this to do that? Like, Oh no, you know, just, um, eat the amount that you're, that you'd like, um, and then kind of just move on. This but is I don't know. That's really tough important. One, what um, do you think? I think this is really important. And, you know, sometimes this might be due to some other marital things going on. And I'm not trying to, like, accuse. But I, I could imagine that, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of divorced parents. And I know that even though they meant well and did such a great job with that difficult situation, there was an element of, like, oh, well, dad doesn't let you do this, but I do, or mom doesn't let you, right. you know, there is this sort of like almost competition of like, who's the coolest parent. And I, right. and I think, you know, ideally that wouldn't be there. So if, if you can look at your marital um, situation, honestly, and kind of, kind of see what's going on there, I think that's step one. Um, because, because I just think that that's crucial for, for the child to get a, a similar, you know, you can't be the same person, but at least a similar type of response from both parents right. in, in all aspects of, of 
childhood, don't you think? I mean, can I Absolutely. go over to my friend's house? Well, mom says no, but I'll go ask dad and he'll say yes. And I mean, that's, whoa, right. that's a problem, right? Right, right, um, right. So, and then here's, here's the other thought I had, Anna, is I often have people in my office who are like super excited about what we're talking about and um, it really resonates and it's really... Uh, freeing and all these great things and then they they leave and they try to explain to their spouse like their spouse will say well what did you talk to Paige about and then they're like uh I don't know how to explain it but it's really cool and it's it's this non-dieting thing and it kind of sounds woo woo and crazy right 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 because they're kind of like it makes sense but they're not to the point where they can kind of reiterate in their own words what what it means to them or why it's important or the benefits right so right. if you and I can take a minute and just model a conversation uh, a spouse could have with yeah. another spouse about why why we approach it this way, maybe potentially someone listening could fast forward to this part of the podcast and be like, okay, this is why I want to approach it this way. Can we get on the same page? Sounds great. Okay. So here's what I'm thinking that I want you to add on. So, you know, it's it's reasonable to approach food the way that we kind of traditionally do. Like, okay, you got to finish your broccoli before you can get more bread, whatever, right? Right. Or you got to finish your whole plate so that you can get some dessert. That that is that's not crazy. If you've come to that, or if that's how you've right. approached it, like you're not a right. weirdo. Like, of course, right. you've been you're, or you're raised that way. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, but research and lots of practical experience um, kind of shows us that that only leads to more pressure, that leads to um, more manipulation potentially in the feeding relationship, and it doesn't really get you to your end goal, which, you know, most parents can can get together and agree that the goal is to have kids who are happy, healthy eaters who eat a wide variety of food, who know when it's time to stop and who know when it's time to eat and who enjoy food, right? Like that's pretty right. much what we want. Right. And although it seems a little bit counterintuitive to approach the feeding relationship with this idea of I'm in charge of what is served, I'm in charge of when it's served, and the child is in charge of if they eat and how much, that seems a little scary that is a really good model to be able to have the highest likelihood of having those goals take ha- happen in real life. Right, right. So um, it's it's reasonable to approach it one way, but actually that, that tends to lead to a lot of the um, consequences that we're really not looking for. And so this is what, this is kind of what the research, but also practical experience has shown actually leads to what we're, what we're aiming for. So, maybe having a conversation around what are our goals for our kids with yes. their eating and how yes. do we get there and really talking that through. I don't know. What what are your thoughts to add? Well, I think what you just said hits the nail on the head, which is what are our goals? What are we, what is, you know, um, is our goal for the child to eat the broccoli at, at dinner right now? Or is our goal for our child to over time learn to eat the broccoli? <laughs> um, and so, to talk through with your, your spouse, um, what, what is our goal? I think that that really hits the nail on the head and, and what do, what structure do we want to put in place to reach those goals? Because may, maybe some of the things that we're doing, um, actually does the opposite. Um, and so sometimes people ask me that, um, who might have a pickier eater, they might say, well, is this going to work? Um, you know, and one, I say, well, it depends on how we define work. <laughs> you know, does, are they going to eat yep. a million foods next week? Probably not. Um, but I will tell you that this, what what is traditionally done, quote, doesn't work. You know, forcing children doesn't work in the long, t- long term. Um, or saying they have to eat all of this before they eat this doesn't, quote, work in the long run. Um so, so I just think you've, you've hit it. What, what are your, what are our goals? And let's figure out what would actually help us um, reach our goals for how we want our children to eat. Right. And, and the big issue for me with got to finish this before you can have that. I remember wanting dessert so much, but having to finish 
this whole plate of food I had or something, you know, lots more food than my body really felt like I could eat. And I like, if my parents are listening, I love you, love you. But I really (laughs) feel like that made me sort of say, okay, it doesn't matter what my body's communicating to me right now that I'm full. What matters is that I'm pleasing my parents, you know? And, um, and that, that started a disconnection with that feeling of fullness for me. And so I, I think that that's really important thing to, to honor that, that the child does know and is connected to what fullness is. And, and it's, it's our job to, to honor that. Absolutely. And, and when we say you have to eat a certain number amount of food in order to get dessert, sometimes we're saying, I want you to eat more than your body needs to right. then eat more than your body needs. Well, <laughs> and know? it's also saying, I know more about your body than you right. do, which is right. like, no. Right, right. No, you don't. You got yeah. It. Like, you don't and, know when I, how much I need to eat and when I need to go to the bathroom. I know those things, you know. Right, right. And, and I think, I'll speak for myself. I don't even know how much my children need and I'm, I've studied nutrition. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, oh, that I agree. They, yeah. yeah. That they know more. So even, um, it's not something any, any of us can know at that certain moment. Um, um, and the other flip side of that is you're the parent. So you get to decide if you're offering dessert tonight. And, um, and that can be done in your head. You don't have to say, well, we're not having dessert tonight because you didn't eat your broccoli. Um, but you don't have to always offer dessert. So yep. there's the, the what. You get to decide the what. So yep. there is a there is a both sides of that. Yeah, great point. Great point. Okay, last, last comment that I've gotten Fabulous. that I wanted to bring up is this. I'm just going to be paraphrasing because she sent me an email. But uh, this person that I'm thinking of is actually in a situation where they're they're living with the grandparents. So meaning, you know, living with her in-laws, I believe. Okay. And um and the the grandparents feeding style is very much the Gucci Gucci goo, eat this food so you can get the, you know, right. <laughs> the other fun food and just like tons and tons of attention and right. pressure and but it's all like fun, so they they don't really associate it with pressure, um, right? But but that's that's another really tricky situation parents can find themselves in is when they've established some really great um, structure and guidelines around food and expectations around food, but then you know it, maybe you're living with someone else who does it differently, or maybe you just go over uh, to their house for a weekend or a vacation or. Um, a, a meal. And, you know, that's one of those, I, I believe, conversations about boundaries. But man, that's tricky, you know? Oh, it's so tough. It is so tough. Um, because, you know, the reality is a lot more people than ourselves are going to be feeding our children. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, when I say when it's grandparents that you're you're visiting for a weekend or for a week, you know, again, your your what you do day in and day out are gonna again speak way way more. But if it's someone you're living with, that's tough. Um, it sounded like with this question, it was they're living with their grandparents. Is that right? They're living with like the the par- the grandparents of their children. So yeah, of so their like children. Their yes. Parents. Yeah. Right. Right. And so for in that situation, it it may be worth a conversation because yeah, it's it's people so. that they're that um, is helping to raise their children. So just like it would be a conversation with your spouse or a conversation with a nanny um, that, you, you know, really explaining um, um, your approach to eating and, ha- and you know, could acknowledge this, this might, this isn't how, you know, you raised me, mom, but this is how we're doing it. And can I talk Ooh, through that's this another you? element. Yeah, because it kind of <laughs> can feel like you're yes. saying, oh, you did a terrible job with this. So I know. I'm, oh, I didn't even think of that. But that's so true. It's so true. I, I feel like that comes up a lot, um, a lot with um, Ooh, grandparents. Oh, yeah, that's an extra tricky grandparent it's, dynamic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so maybe a conversation and um, a, a similar thing that we talked about earlier about these are our goals for our children with food, and right. this is how we believe that we'll get there. And I've heard feedback that people think that this is um, kind of like that, that, 
some people who in people's lives who listen are saying, that's just like hippie stuff. That's weird stuff. That's, you know, just kind of like brushing it off and writing it right. off as like weird new age parenting tactics or whatever. Um, right. But I think truly like it's actually just getting back to the way things yes. kind of naturally can be, you know. I'm I'm with you. I actually I think I I hear that a lot too. Exactly what you're saying, but I really think of it as almost the opposite. Like this is common sense um, parenting. Um, that all this focus on food and weight is getting us further and further away yeah. from common sense parenting. And let's go back to kind of what makes sense. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Some yeah. appropriate structure. Um, and you said something just a few minutes ago that I wanted to just speak up on really quickly because I'm a working mom and you are too. Yeah. Um, we have, you know, obviously people helping us with our children while we work. And um, that is another dynamic and element to this, to this approach with food is setting some expectations with people who watch your children, whether it's a nanny right. or a daycare or whatever. Um and, you know, if you do it in a gentle diplomatic way, there's actually potential for for some education and for that other person to do, um, you know, maybe perhaps do better in their own lives with food, too. But I, I think it's reasonable to to have those conversations with people who are around your children and just say, this is how we approach food. This is what I would like you to to do when you feed my children. And um, yeah. This, yeah, absolutely. This is how we do that's, it. So. I, I just, um, that's something that's come up in my house very recently with summer. That I have a, a fabulous um, nanny helping us for the summer. And after a week or two, she said, she would tell me every day what she fed the children. And she said, um, it's really intimidating feeding children of a dietitian. Yeah, I had that same <laughs> and I, thing said to and me. I, and I said, I care more about how you feed my children than what. Um and because I had really talked to her about Ellen Satter and not talking about calories and weight, um, but I hadn't focused so much on what. Um, so she was intimidated, like, oh, what does this mean? What am I supposed yeah, to do? Yeah, what I be feeding them? Is this okay that I fed, you know? So um, so it's all, it's all interesting because I think usually people – worry about, okay, I need to make sure they eat these certain foods. Um, and this is a new, a different approach. So that conversation is so great and so important. Yes. Yes. Oh, this has been so awesome. Um, what, I love is there anything you else you want to say with this? I, I know we, we just kind of went off the cuff and talked about these, these comments we've gotten, which by the way, those were really, really awesome questions. That was so, that helped us dive into some other areas within within this topic that I think are so important. And, you know, we obviously always have blind spots when we have our own experiences and we tend to talk about those. So it's really awesome to hear uh, Absolutely. these questions. They were great. Yeah, because um, it um, they're real questions. And I, I like I said, at the end of the last one, I never want to come off on, OK, you know, I have the answer to this because it's not true. We have this structure, but then in each little family, it ha it it's going to be approached differently. Um, and so thinking through um, how is this going to work in your own family is so important. And it's, um, you know, I wish, I wish there was one answer to, for everyone because it would be much easier. Um, so I loved all these questions because it, we need to be thinking about it in all different ways. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And the way I would summarize today, the today's themes were, um, you know, show, rather than tell whenever possible, ask lots of questions for to help your kids come to their own conclusions and answers. Um, it's never too late to make a change. And Great. structure is typically kind of where you want to start at least and just see, can I apply more structure? Maybe that means simplifying some activities. Maybe that means rescheduling some of your, your day. Um, and it's okay to say no. And um, conversations about goals with with your partners in parenting, whether that's um, your parents helping you with parenting or a nanny or a, a spouse or a partner, or whatever it is, having those conversations about, about goals and how we accomplish them and really trying to get 
everybody consistent in in this approach and in this supportive environment. I think those are the themes that came up for me. Anything else you'd add? Oh, I think you hit them all. I, I love that summary. Um, I, I, I think you hit every one. Um, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> well, Anna, this has been awesome. I've loved this. Um, just take a minute to talk about uh, how people can keep in touch with you if they'd like. I know you already mentioned that on our last one, but just take a second to do it again if you don't mind. Great. Um, anyone is welcome to email me if they'd like, and I'll make sure that pay, Paige, if you could attach my email, is that right? Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have, my practice has a um, Facebook page, which is Lutz Alexander and Associates Nutrition Therapy. And um, we love to post interesting information about child feeding um, nutrition and eating disorders on there if um, if someone's interested in getting information that way. Um, and you can also check out our website, which is LutzAndAlexander.com. Perfect. And I'll link to all of that. And I'm also planning on linking to the Division of Responsibility um, Fabulous. kind of explanation from Ellen Satter because we did refer to that quite a bit today. That sounds great. Okay. I really love talking to you today, Paige. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for being here. This was awesome. I loved it. Great. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. Thanks again so much for listening, and we'll see you soon for another episode.